Welcome back everybody to Fair Facts, where we provide you on the latest in Fairfax County Public Schools and discuss important topics concerning our community. As always, I'm your host, Abrar Omesh, one of your at-large members on the Fairfax County School Board. And I'm honored today to be amongst national experts on the topic of critical race theory. Uh, so we'll talk about that in just a moment. I want to make sure that uh, we frame our conversation. Of course, we know that we are wrapping up African American History Month, uh, where we commemorated a number of leaders and the contributions of exceptional folks across our history. Uh, but of course, this conversation is broader. And I know there have been some many questions from the community already in anticipation of this conversation. Uh, because as you all know, uh, we don't really teach CRT in Fairfax County Public Schools, uh, but no doubt uh, uh, want to unpack and discuss the importance of uh, some of the thinking around uh, where this came from and, and why it's important. And I also want to make sure it's clear to our community who are kind of confused about why we're having this <laughs> all together, uh, that in fact, uh, things like racism, discrimination, bias affect our students on a daily basis. Uh, they are instructional issues. They are priorities uh, for us as education leaders when thinking about cultivating environments of belonging that allow kids to thrive and learn in safe and healthy environments. So uh, as you all know, in the same way that things like food access uh, are, are barriers to learning and are priorities for us as a collective to make sure that a kid isn't sitting hungry in class and can't pay attention, uh, these social issues are also key considerations to make sure that kids feel motivated in school. Uh, so when a kid doesn't see themselves in curriculum, for example, they may feel a disconnect, right? And that affects their, their motivation as a student and their self-actualization and their potential uh, for how far they can go and as how far they can dream. Uh, so that's uh, just framing out today is so the importance of this conversation, even for us as thought leaders and education leaders in K-12, uh, and especially here in Fairfax County, where we continue to experience our growing pains as we come together in understanding how we fit uh, uh, together in a collective cause of building a greater community and society. So joining uh, us are a number of national experts. I do want to encourage you all to suspend your judgments before jumping to conclusions. I know we're all coming at this with various thoughts, opinions, maybe uh, questions, uh, but it's very important for us as we come together to, to maybe walk in with our hearts uh, and open minds to engage with the ideas. And, and you know, some of our conversation today will uh, perhaps be uh, aligned and some of, some of it will be a little challenging. Let's, let's talk about the reasons why this has become so uh, uh, polarizing and, and how it can actually be something that brings us together as we better understand uh, the overall objectives. Um, so I, I encourage our audience. And of course, uh, our audience, you're welcome to put in questions, to uh, contribute through the chat. We'll be monitoring it. Um, and I know some of you were concerned that maybe controversial questions won't be posed. I promise you, I will be uh, uh, bringing in everything to the conversation to make sure folks walk away with a good understanding. Um, so without further ado, I want to thank and welcome our uh, incredible guests. Uh, we have Dr. Rashan Ray, Senior Fellow at Brookings and Director of the Lab for Applied Social Science Research. We have Dr. Rodney Coates, critical race professor, sociologist, and global decolonization scholar. We have Jennifer, Dr. Jennifer Ho, an ethnic studies professor and president of the Association for Asian American Studies. Uh, Dr. Nolan Cabrera, education policy and practice expert and professor of critical theory and American Indian studies. And we have Dr. Benjamin Parker, an educational theory and practice expert and CR, critical race historian uh, at Loyola U University of Maryland. Um, so thank you all for joining us uh, tonight for an important conversation. I want to also make sure the community is aware. I did invite some uh, collaborators from varying perspectives um, who thought it might not be a worthwhile conversation for them today, but we hope to engage with and contend with uh, all kinds of ideas regardless. So with that, I am going to uh, let Dr. Ray start us off with a bit of an explanation and introduction to what CRT even is, and then let's break down the ideas further to hopefully make them digestible for our community. So uh, Dr. Ray, please go ahead. Yes, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here this evening and have this important conversation. I'm particularly excited to hear from the experts that you were able to bring together. I really don't think people understand kind of the star power and intellectual rigor that they're gonna hear from. So I'm gonna be quick and give a, a broad overview, a high level overview, particularly thinking about the impact that discussions about critical race theory has had on policy, which is some of the analyses that we've done at Brookings and then allow for the other scholars to be able to get into this a lot deeper. So I'm gonna give this high level primer on critical race theory. 
and talk about the impact that it has on states and schools. Um, late in 2021, my colleague at Brookings, Alexandra Gibbons and I, we wrote an article, Why Are States Banning Critical Race Theory? And we've continuously updated that particular article to take a deep dive into what's happening in states and a lot of school boards and school districts at the state level and the local level across the country. So why is critical race theory controversial? Well, first, opponents of critical race theory fear that it admonishes all white people for being uh, for, for being oppressors while classifying all Black people as being hopelessly oppressive victims. This is part of the broader framework that people have. Some parents claim to be worried that their children are being blamed for racism and or discussing race and racism makes their children uncomfortable and sad. News media, particularly uh, far right-wing uh, news media, have latched onto critical race theory as the new, what we call boogeyman for people unwilling to acknowledge our country's racist history and how it impacts the present. However, these narratives about the CRT are gross exaggerations of the theoretical framework as you will probably hear from the other experts. Accordingly, from a broad level, critical race theory evolved from legal studies as a way to explain racial disparities that cannot be addressed through individual behavior. Part of thinking about this are some of the key scholars, Derrick Bell, Kimberly Crenshaw, Richard Delgado, Cheryl Harris. If you have not read their work, I encourage you to do so. Oftentimes what happens with these broader discussions when things come out of the ivory tower and as the experts will further tell you, these particular theoretical frameworks of how we think about critical race theory, legal studies, how we think about social science in this particular context has been around for decades now. I encourage people to really read these particular scholars because they are some of, some of the original ones that have done that, but also the scholars here on this panel that continuously highlight these frameworks. Critical race theory, in a very simplistic definition, proclaims that US social institutions are laced with racism embedded in laws, regulations, rules, procedures that lead to differential outcomes by race. Social institutions oftentimes include the criminal justice system, the education system, the labor market, the housing market, and the healthcare system, and many others that we could also name. And importantly, as sociologists such as Eduardo Benia Silva notes, that racism can exist without racist. And that becomes one of the main ways the critical race theory approaches his work is looking at it from an institutional perspective, a systemic perspective, rather than solely thinking about individuals. Accordingly, critical race theory does not attribute racism to white people as individuals or even, or even to entire groups of people. However, many Americans are not able to separate their individual identity as American from the social institutions that govern them. These people oftentimes perceive themselves to be part of the system. And I think that is the crutch of a large part of the issues in these broader discussions that's being missed. Consequently, these individuals interpret calling social institutions racist as calling them racist personally. And as sociologist Victor Ray noted, making laws outlawing critical race theory confirms the point that racism is embedded in the law. So when it comes to the impact of critical race theory on schools and school systems, broadly, and the scholars here will tell you this, critical race theory is primarily taught at the graduate level and sometimes at the undergraduate level, particularly if a university has a focus program on race, if it's a need for it um, at the University of Maryland, while we definitely teach courses in race relations, I teach some of these large courses, critical race theory is often just one of the many theoretical frameworks that are used throughout the course. And until recently, it wasn't something that students actually ask about. But now because it's in the media, students are asking about it more. Accordingly, what good educators do is actually respond to the students that are in their classroom. And this is happening not only at the collegiate level, but potentially at the high school level. But accordingly, up until recently, critical race theory is not taught at the K through 12 level in any way. However, fears about critical race theory have spurred school boards and state legislatures from Tennessee to Ohio to ban teachings about racism in classrooms. And that's what's key, teachings about racism, as I'll show you in a second from our analysis about, uh, about the legislation, that the legislation isn't solely focused on critical race theory, but instead is much broader than that. Accordingly, uh, these bans have created a chilling effect 
on how teachers and educators, particularly in K through 12 schools, present material and have classrooms discussions. And of course, we know there are other things that have happened. Protest, firings of teachers and administrators, the banning of books, which is pretty interesting and goes against the First Amendment, the banning of words that promote inclusiveness, diversity, anti-racism and belonging, and children, it's also preventing them from learning the unvarnished truth about America. And, and we might be destined to actually repeat what they don't necessarily learn. Now, when it comes across the United States, if we look at all the states and territories, 36 states have introduced or passed similar legislation. To tell you the progress there on that front in terms of the growth, when we wrote our article last fall in November, it was roughly 20 states that had introduced or passed legislation. So we see that the number has almost doubled in just a few months. However, there are also 17 states, some of which are part of the 36, that have actually aimed to expand discussions about racism and bias, more or less saying that what students actually need to do is learn about this information. Once we learn about this information, get on the same page, that that is the approach to actually address racial inequality compared to taking uh, a colorblind approach that scholars know don't necessarily work. Here goes the bottom line. Few of the state bills that have been passed explicitly even mention the word critical race theory. Now, this, this is at the state level. So you have these bans, and very few of the legislation actually mention critical race theory. So what, do the, what does the legislations actually do? Well, they mostly ban the discussion, the training and or orientation that the US is inherently racist, as well as any discussions about conscious and unconscious bias, privilege, discrimination, and oppression. A lot of stuff. These parameters also extend well beyond race to include uh, discussions about gender and other topics. Some state school boards and local school boards in states across the country have introduced new guidelines barring critical race theory related discussions. And when we look across the country, these are the states in orange that you see that have either passed or introduced legislation. And it's important to note where this is coming from. Um, under the Trump administration early on, he put into effect a policy that government workers and contractors could not have any trainings related to implicit bias, unconscious bias, and diversity related issues. Once Trump got out of office, Biden reinstituted the policy that, mind you, was under President Bush. It's not like this was an Obama thing. This has just been something that's been done to have trainings about ways to be more equitable. But then what some individuals, particularly state legislatures, took up was to start trying to expand that at the local level. They also are now encroaching not only on schools, but also uh, at workplaces and also in places uh, of religious institutions and houses of worship. But as I noted, there are also some states that are going in the opposite direction, saying that we need to actually have a discussion about racism and bias. So when we look at this collectively, this is where we are. And look, one thing that I'll say as a parent, since we're talking about schools, as a parent of elementary school students um, that have experienced various things, if my children are old enough to experience racism, I think the kids their age are also old enough to hear about it and learn about it so that we can aim to ensure that what happens to my children and other children, whether that be about racism or other form of, forms of difference, are things that don't necessarily exist. So look, thank you for your time, and I really look forward to the rest of the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ray, for orienting us uh, and speaking to the importance of having context. Uh, of course, you know, that is, is essential in understanding where this comes from and, and what the ideas associated with it are. So really appreciate you doing that for us today, uh, which brings us really to the broader conversation, too, of how this affects the ways we think even in K-12 education. Uh, so I want to pose to the rest of the panel, help put your work in context for us. Uh, obviously, you all are experts in various angles. Uh, to this work. Um, how does this relate to justice, equity, diversity, and, and inclusion efforts? Why does it matter? And especially, why does it matter for K-12 students and educators? Let me jump in here. Um, and let me start with a quote. What to the American slave is the 4th of July? a day that reveals to him the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is the constant victim. 
to him your celebration is a sham. Your shouts of liberty and equality hollow mockery. There is not a nation on earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of these United States at this hour. That's Frederick Douglass, 1852. Today, that would be called critical race theory. Okay. Now, we should separate between critical race theory and a critical appraisal of history. Okay. And those are two different things. All right. Uh, the 1619 Project is not critical race theory, but it is a critical appraisal of history. Okay. And let me tell you what, in my definition, a critical appraisal of history is. This is when we hear the voices of all people within this context. Okay. I mean, I use the example in my class when I teach critical race. Uh, uh, what would happen if a rape has occurred and the only person that we hear testimony from is the perpetrator of that rape? Okay. What would happen if, 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 if we take the Heritage Foundation, the book that they would like for uh, to be used in school? Okay, uh, in, in, in K through 12 to teach history is called uh, 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 How to Make America. And basically it, it, it celebrates slavery and, 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 and its institutions and whiteness. Okay, uh, uh, in, and by the way, it whitewashes that whole history. Okay, imagine what it would be like if we, if we had the voices of women Okay, in history. Okay, uh, uh, imagine if we were able to talk to the indigenous natives, okay, about their experience in this country. Imagine if we talk to the immigrants of all uh, hues and colors and, and cultures, all right? That would be a critical historical analysis, okay? And that's what's missing in school. One other thing that critical race can inform us is, is how we teach. Okay, and I'll, I'll leave with this comment. We just finished a, a, a major grant with the uh, National Science Foundation uh, that, 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 that looks at an inclusive pedagogy. Okay, if you look at many of our chemistry books, our biology books, uh, our history books, the principal person, the principal heroes in those books are white males. Okay, what would happen if we taught chemistry and, and, and Native Americans saw themselves in that chemistry book, by the way, as inventors of science? What would happen if women saw themselves as, as major theorists? Okay, what would happen if we talked about the philosophers of, of, of I Ching and the philosophies of the Apache and the philosophies of the uh, 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 Iroquois? Okay, it would change what we do. Okay. All right, that's what the critical historical perspective would do within the high school uh, perspective. Thank you so much, Dr. Coates. Um, I know uh, those are some powerful words and I, I know Dr. Ray um, does have to, to have step away, but thank you so much for joining us today. Um, so with that, uh, we will hear from our next powerful contributor. I think that might be me. Dr. Ho. Um, yeah. <laughs> So um, I, I, first of all, thank you for inviting me. Thank you to my other illustrious panelists. Um, I guess I wanted to contextualize how I think about critical race theory and how I teach it. Um, and much like what everyone else is saying, critical race theory really is a field of study that's taught at the college and, um, and graduate level. So it's not to say that there couldn't be critical race theory classes taught in the high school level, but given the kind of scholarship associated with critical race theory and given the fact that the theory itself is fairly dense, it's unlikely that an elementary um, school teacher is gonna be doing entrance convergence theory with sixth graders. Um, so the analogy that I've used, um, and I, I'm gonna put a few links in the chat for a broad to share out to people, so I was invited to write an opinion piece by the Colorado Re Recorder about critical race theory. And so the analogy I've used is um, middle school students in the seventh grade are likely learning about electricity, doing experiments with electricity, but they are not being taught electrical engineering. So that's whenever people are talking about critical race theory infiltrating K through 12 school districts, it's really important to note that um, it, it's really not happening 
in the way that those of us who teach critical race theory in the college level understand. Now, here's another question. What would be wrong with, with creating appropriate lesson plans in the way that um, Dr. Coates has just described that talk about the accurate history of the United States. The fact that this, I am, I am currently coming to you from um, the traditional territories of the Cheyenne, Arapaho and Ute nations. And I'm not giving this land acknowledgement out of any kind of performative sense. I'm, I'm just factually stating that I understand that I'm on indigenous land. Um, so that's where we begin when we talk about the United States or where we should begin. And then how did the United States grow to be such a rich superpower? Um, a lot of the wealth derived out of um, the transatlantic slave trade. Again, these are just facts and you can have feelings about these facts, but these are just facts and we should be able to talk about these facts. Um, the last thing I wanna say is that I get asked by my students a lot about when we're gonna end racism. And what I say to them is, even if we could figure out a way to end racism, we would have to then also figure out a way to end patriarchy and toxic masculinity. And we'd have to figure out a way to end anti-LGBTQ+. We'd have to figure out a way to affirm and value the lives of queer people, which I, I just wanna just pause a moment and say, as much as critical race theory is being attacked, the kinds of attacks on LGBTQ+, students around the nation, especially the don't say gay bill that's, that they're trying to pass through in Florida. Um, there was an amendment to the bill that the legislator actually took out. That amendment would have required K through 12 teachers to out queer students in Florida. And there's another bill that they're trying to pass in Texas to make transgender students, the parents of transgender students to report them to Child Protective Services. So in other words, in Texas, they want to say that the parents of transgender students have somehow harmed and abused their child to the point that they should be reported. And these kinds of attacks on queer families and LGBTQ plus people are deeply intertwined to the attacks that we are seeing on critical race theory and people of color and indigenous people. And I'll stop there. All right, uh, so this is, uh, I guess, dang, why'd you put me in this order? I don't wanna follow that. <laughs> Jennifer, drop and fire right there. I appreciate that. But um, greetings, everybody from from uh, Arizona, and I have a uh, a couple of sort of historical um, and I, I'm using historical uh, very loosely, but sort of context to uh, this overall discussion and debate, um, because fundamentally, uh, as I think it's sort of been implied in some in the previous commentaries, we're not having an honest conversation here. Right. It, it, if we were, you know, let's say that we were saying, you know, hey, uh, what works better for the United States? You know, a flat tax, a progressive tax. We have empirical data we can figure out, you know, and, and try to see what kind of an outcome we want. What I mean, we're not having an honest conversation here is the, the, the way that Dr. Ray said there has been this trumpeting of critical race theory as a boogeyman, as like, oh, my God white parents, and it is parent that it's very clear, white parents, critical race theory is coming for your kids. You better watch out and take control of it. Now, part of the reason why I'm very familiar with this is in Arizona, and in particular in Tucson, Arizona, we had a highly successful Mexican American studies program where the state of Arizona and the state legislature actually passed a bill to ban said program. And it's, I feel like I'm in that bad Bill Murray, well, actually it's a pretty good movie, but that Bill Murray movie, Groundhog Day, where it's literally the same thing repeating itself. So what happened then? You had a Mexican American studies program. Do the people of Arizona know what Mexican American studies is? No, they just know it's different. So you take that difference and you say there's something going on in Arizona and then you create a definition around it. It's hateful, it's anti-Western, it's anti-white, it's anti, it's, it's anti, it's un-American what they're doing and how dare your tax dollars go to that. And people don't tend to step back in the situation and say, well, you know, because it seems like why would a politician spend all of this time investing in defining something like this 
if it wasn't true. Well, that's actually part of, that's exactly it. That what the people, there were two legislators, Tom Horn and John Huppenthal, who were both just trumpeting that really, really hardcore. And it actually made them, it got them uh, advanced in the state in, 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 to their next political office. It was a winning ticket because you take this thing, you make it scary. And then a lot of the ways that Trump did, you say, hey, here's a problem and I'm the only one who can solve it for you. And it's like, it's, 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 it's kind of like people have used the analogy of like, you're both an arsonist and a fireman. Like you don't get credit for starting the fire, but that's exactly what a lot of these politicians are doing is they're creating, they're creating a fire and then trying to, but they don't really want to put it out. They just say that they have the ability to put it out. And so for me, that's really what we're doing right now. And in many respects, that's why panels like this are so important because it allows us to really call out that lie and to say that, no, there's nothing factual about this. And then to be able to actually engage in the meaningful conversation, because in many respects, my position is that it's not that we don't have too much critical race theory. It's actually that we don't have enough critical race theory. It's that if we did have the level of critical race theory that the right-wing politicians are proclaiming, we actually wouldn't be having this debate at all because people would be having an honest reckoning with the difficulties of our past. And in many respects, critical race theory and also just sort of critical analyses as a whole serve as a form of social agitation. And people do not like that agitation, but I really, and I wanted to get this right, uh, but W.E.B. Du Bois talked about agitation very clearly and looked at both sides of it in a, in, in a profound way and said that agitation is a necessary evil to tell the ills of suffering. And that, that's it right there. It's, it's, it's the way that Adondo said, truth is that which allows suffering to speak. And all too often, we don't want to face up to those harsh realities because we become implicated in them. And he says, now without it, a nation has been lulled into false security and preened itself with virtues it did not possess. And in many respects, that's exactly what we're talking about here. And that's in many respects why our country is in such a state of stunted growth, because we can't meaningfully engage with this kind of agitation. We can't meaningfully engage with, this, with, with the sins of our past. And as a consequence, we keep repeating them over and over and over again, and we don't advance. We're so caught up in saying America's number one, America's the best, that we actually keep slipping in every meaningful category along those lines. And for my international friends, they always say that America is the number one, is, is definitively number one at one thing. And it's saying that America is number one. And, but just because we say it doesn't make it true. And as a matter of fact, it's extremely harmful. So critical race theory allows us to have these important reckonings, but at the same time, the attacks on it are just political opportunism creating a boogeyman and then trying to, like when you don't have a political agenda, create a problem and then say, I'll solve it. That's it. It may have worked for Vanilla Ice in the 1990s. It's not really effective for policy right now. Hello, first of all, uh, I just, I wanna thank all the panelists. Uh, I think they've, they've sort of done a fantastic job of just kind of laying out this groundwork and sort of getting us started here. Um, I want to say also thank you to, to everyone that's participating in this meeting. Uh, engaging in this type of dialogue is a vital first step for us sort of uh, together coming to um, an understanding of something that I think is largely just misunderstood. That's why I really appreciate this, this platform for us to kind of have this discussion. Uh, I also greatly appreciate all of those with, with vested interests in education, parents, teachers, administrators, students, community members uh, who have given so much time for so long, uh, but particularly in the context of these, these past few school years, right? We recognize the, the difficulties of, of kind of this experience. Um, and, and again, just the fact that, you know, you're here, you're participating in this is, is greatly appreciated from all of us. And what we wanna do is we wanna use this platform as a space to have kind of these honest conversations uh, and, and do as much as possible to, to make it sort of something that's dynamic. So uh, I think one thing that, you know, I really want to sort of build on is, is this, this misunderstanding of, of what CRT is intended to do, right? It's really at its most basic level, it's intended to, to confront racism. Um, 
And racism is a term that that really is it's it's loaded, right? We have ideas of what racism looks like, of what it sounds like, of what it is. So when we hear that, right, we have these certain kind of things that you know populate in our in our own sort of personal imagery of of what that is and how that exists. And I think we need to move on um, and kind of move beyond that that initial sense of of what racism is, right? We need to think of it beyond it just being sort of individual bad actors or beyond it being sort of overt displays that we all could recognize as, you know, that's a, that's a racist action or a racist term. Um, and what we need to recognize and what CRT really does in this confrontation of, of racism is, is uncovering how racism has been passed into law, right? how it has been baked into everyday policies and practices, and ultimately how it impacts the way people experience the world. And in this particular context, we're thinking about how students uh, engage in schools. So that's what we're here to do. And again, uh, thank you for being here. Thank you all for those introductory comments, um, certainly insightful. Uh, and, and to your point right there, Dr. Parker, in thinking of the impact on students, the importance of these conversations on a national scale, uh, and progress uh, that will help their experiences in the classroom. Um, I did want to bring forward, you know, some distinctions and, and hear you all's feedback around them. Uh, you know, I, I think one of the uh, difficulties in people kind of recognizing that CRT is not really taught in the K-12 classroom, but perhaps is more of a uh, an academic or research, uh, you know, based kind of conversation. Um, that maybe our approach towards individuals and people and the ways we have race-based conversations with human beings through compassion is different uh, than dealing with structures of power and having conversations around systems. Um, so I, you know, value your insights around that, which, you know, bring me to some of the concerns some folks have, like deconstructing uh, our views outside of uh, kind of the bubble a bit. Um, not all, not all critiques of CRT are necessarily racist, right? We contend with that. Um, perhaps, you know, CRT and teaching truth could actually live in separate uh, places. I, I want us to add some nuance perhaps to the conversation. Um, I know some of our community members have been concerned about this privilege bingo thing, right? That happened in one of our classrooms. I, I, I've heard some concerns about that. Um, and I want to mention, obviously in a system this big implementation wise, we're still working on understanding what what works and what doesn't. So I, I won't speak to that particularly, um, but I go back to this idea of the conversation around systems versus people. How does that uh, look different um, on the ground? Where do, you know, where do we come out um, in having some appreciation for where people are coming from and perhaps having some disagreement, but really not being racist or want, being well-meaning and wanting to understand um, and perhaps finding a, a difficulty um, in, in what has become a polarized conversation. So anyone who wants to chime in yeah. on that. Let me, let me start with some, let me dispel some misperceptions, okay? Everybody's biased. Let me repeat that. Everybody's biased. I, 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 I give example in my class, uh, and I've got, I teach at a predominantly white institution, and most of my students are white, all right? And I say, imagine that your mother is standing on a street corner, and Dr. Coates is standing on that same street corner and a Mack truck is getting ready to hit one of them. Who are you going to save? Okay. And if you say anything but your mother, I'm going to call her up right now and tell her, you know, uh, 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 that, 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 that means that we're all biased. Okay. Uh, 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 and this notion of white guilt also needs to be dismantled. Okay. Anything that 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 suggests that everybody shares a, the same stereotype is in and of itself biased and uh, a, a racist. So therefore, white guilt, white privilege, white fragility, okay, are all stereotypes. All whites do not share in privilege. All whites are not guilty. All whites are not frail, okay? Uh, 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 in my class just yesterday, we looked at, at uh, 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 the radical poetics of Appalachians, okay? Uh, and, and looked at the, uh, uh, the, the experience of racism that they have historically lived in this country. Okay, they've been racialized, they've been harmed because they are not perceived as being as white as others. Okay, uh, and 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 when we when by the way when we use these terms, 
uh, and, and suggests that, that, that whites are guilty by virtue of being white, uh, and blacks are, are, are victims by virtue of being black, uh, then, then, then we are playing the race game, okay? By the way, uh, there were blacks who owned slaves. By the way, uh, Europeans did not go into Africa and enslave the Africans. They went there and purchased Africans uh, uh, on the slave market sold by other Africans. So let's get that straight. What that means is, is that we spent over $60 billion in the last 10 years to deal with issues of diversity in the corporate world, schools, institutions, so forth and so on. And most of them are dealing with some kind of bias, okay? Uh, implicit bias, so forth and so on. Guess what? Dealing with people's biases does not change the structures of racism. And that gets into a basic definition. Okay, racism is discriminate is bias plus power. Okay, all right. That means that having the bias and then having the institutional power to enforce that bias. Okay. The other thing to take in consideration, therefore, is that it is it is embedded within systems, practices, and policies. Oh, and these institutions are are systematically linked. So, and I want you to deal with this quickly because your, your, your parents can understand this. We talk about the cradle to prison pipeline, okay? That links three different institutions together, okay? One starting with the schools. If you have a higher expulsion rate of certain students based upon their race, by the way, based upon their sexuality, uh, by the way, based upon their class, all right? Uh, uh, and what you do, all right, then those individuals, one, are not going to graduate from high school. And what do kids that don't graduate from high school do in urban cities and many other areas? They hang out in the malls, they hang out on the corners. Guess what? I'm the son of a cop. My brother's a state trooper in Illinois. They're more likely to get arrested, okay? They're more likely to get involved in crime, so forth and so on, okay? Uh, uh, hanging out, okay? Uh, that's why, by the way, one of the reasons why we've got K-12 through schools uh, in this country and in other countries is to keep kids off the street, out of these dangerous settings so that they can learn something as opposed to this. Oh, but so but so now, by the way, you, you didn't finish school. Oh, by the way, now you've been arrested by the police. You've got a record. Oh, that also means you're not participating in the political structure. Okay, so that's the third institution. Oh, I forgot this fourth institution. You don't have an education. You've got a criminal record. Oh, you're also not getting a good job. Now we've got four institutions working together collaboratively, okay, to keep individuals down, okay? Oh, because the, we tend to concentrate on Native American men, African uh, American men, Hispanic men, in this process, they're more likely to be criminalized and so, so therefore they're less likely to be available to be parents to their kids, okay? That leads to a fourth problem called the feminization of poverty, okay? Uh, and you're not gonna solve this by, by talking to individuals about, you know what, persuasion. I, I want you to like me. Will you love me? Will you treat me nicely? No, that has to be dealt with systemically what Kendi talks about in changing the structures, okay? And I'll stop right there. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Coates. That was essential in kind of parsing through bias that can that happens on all sides and all and not even sides in every direction, uh, and that certain aspects of bias may be empowered um, to cause harm. Uh, Dr. Ho, I see that you've unmiked yourself. Go ahead. Yeah, I I, I too um, when I do workshops and with my students really emphasize that racism needs to be understood as a system, and not an identity category. Um, I guess the other thing I want to kind of think through, since um, there may be a lot of parents listening to this, in many of the news pieces that I have seen, um, where there are parents who are concerned about critical race theory, those parents, and, and it's impossible for me to know, but I would say optically look like they may identify as white, and in some cases have identified themselves as white and they have identified their, their children as white. And but we're, we're not really hearing a lot of news stories about um, what black parents feel, what um, Latino, Latina, Latinx parents feel, what indigenous parents feel, what Jewish parents feel, what Asian Americans parents feel, what Muslim parents feel, um, what queer parents feel about the various 
attacks on critical race theory, the various book bans, the various bills, that the focus has largely been on what, what we could say is the dominant society, on white Americans, what white Americans think about related to um, how race is being talked about. And in some cases, some of these bills really specifically say they don't want students to feel discomfort. And I think it's really interesting that we're introducing now in the last year and a half, this word discomfort, this, um, that somehow we think that discomfort interrupts learning. And I guess I would invite us to think about why we haven't been thinking about that level of discomfort previously. Why is it now we're concerned about the discomfort of students, whereas um, when I was growing up in my K through 12 life in the San Francisco Bay Area, and I think most people associate the San Francisco Bay Area with, with being kind of the multi-ethnic, multiracial Mecca. Um, but I will tell you that the only thing I remember learning about Asian Americans was that Chinese came and built the railroad. So all I knew was that somehow Chinese people came to California, built the railroad. I never learned how they came. I never learned anything about what their labor conditions were, right? Like why, why were Chinese people recruited to build the railroad, right? I never learned anything about what happened to these Chinese laborers who helped build the railroad. It was just sort of like Chinese came, built the railroad, you should be proud, right? And then it wasn't until I got to college where I was like, oh wait, these Chinese laborers who helped build the railroad, by the way, that went through indigenous land. So it was very dangerous, right? Given what was going on with the federal government and various indigenous tribes were stranded. They were stranded in Utah. They were told by the railroad that in order to get back to San Francisco, they had to pay. They had to pay for fare on a railroad, which of course, because they were not being compensated well, because they were, there was disproportionate pay that they were receiving versus the Irish laborers, they couldn't afford to, a train to get back to San Francisco, right, from Utah. So they are literally stranded um, in Utah as Chinese laborers, right? Um, that would have been helpful to have learned about the complete history. And so I guess I would invite any white parents who are listening specifically who are concerned that critical race theory is being taught or concerned that the history of race and racism is being taught in K through 12 schools, what exactly is the worry, right? What exactly is the worry about students who may feel discomfort and are they thinking about black students and Latino, Latina, Latinx students and Asian American students um, and what their level of discomfort may be in not being able to get complete history in the classroom. So, so to, to, uh, to piggyback off of that, um, I think part of the reason why there's a, a pushback is we have really, you know, we're talking about sort of rounding out the analysis uh, painting a fuller picture. I'd say even on the level of our, our localized discussions, we have problems with race because we misidentify sort of the source of the problem. And we do this with race, we do this with poverty. Like if we ever say that there's like, that there's a gender issue, immediately it says women. If there's a racial problem, it's racial minorities. If there's a poverty problem, you know, like, like here in Tucson, people, do all the pearl clutching around those poor brown kids on the south side of town, but not understanding that these concepts always are in relation to each other. You can't have up if you don't have down. You can't have hot if you don't have cold. You can't have privileged if you don't have marginalized, et cetera, right? But we're so apt to talk about, oh, those poor kids over there, but without having an analysis on the other side of opportunity hoarding and you know, systemic redlining and all of the different ways in which racism is embedded and has really codified different social privileges into our work and so or in, into our social institutions. And it doesn't make people feel very good um, because, but just because it, here's, here's the ultimate irony of it is that in many respects right now we're having a, uh, uh, we're having a conversation that's really guided by white parents feeling uncomfortable about something. Well, what has been the right wing mantra for the last decade? Facts don't care about your feelings. That's like on Ben Shapiro's Twitter page. Like that's his, you know, and that's the problem right now is that there's outrage over something that doesn't even exist and it's all in their feels and that their feels are real. You know, and so the, it's 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 a difficult situation when you have things like that. 
I'm going to do something that I really, I don't tend to like doing, but I'm going to try threading this needle a bit because everyone goes, Hey, I had this idea and I would love it if you engaged this idea. Um, but we, we had a, in, in our chat, um, problems with, you know, the concept of, of privilege, in particular white privilege. And Dr. Coates talked about it. Um, there's, there was a privilege bingo game and things like that. I've tried to flip that concept a little bit. And instead of talking about white privilege, talk about white immunity. That is not necessarily saying you have an elevated social status, but asking the question, in a systemically racist society, being white creates a sort of social inoculation from the disparate treatment that people of color receive on a regular basis. And if you start from that perspective, then again, go, going back to what Dr. Ho was saying, you're not sitting there continually focusing on yourself, right? Oh, what's gonna happen to me? What's gonna happen to my kids? It actually shifts the analysis to what has been happening to, to low-income brown kids, indigenous kids, black kids, Asian American kids, as a regular function of their schooling that we would never tolerate if it was, people in the vanilla suburbs that were experiencing it. It actually, and, and really what we're, what, and, and I don't, I, I definitely agree with Dr. Coates that, you know, uh, individually working through racism and bias is not gonna solve our problems. However, creating a sense of linked fate and radical empathy can be a jumping off point to having the larger discussions about changing the social structures. And in many respects, that's what we're trying to do here is trying to say that if there's racialized harm being done to our social body, that it's being done to all, it, you know, that, that it does harm all of us. And in many respects, that's what we need, to, that, that's part of the discussion that we need to have right now. But in order to do that, part of the way is how do we start that conversation? And we're way, way, way behind on, on, on doing that. But I do think that many ways of creating that sense of linked fate. It's not that look at those poor kids over there or actually going back to San Francisco. God, if I hear another tech bro go, I had to walk over a homeless guy on my way to work with like this disgust. And it's like, yeah, because your company doesn't pay freaking taxes. So there's no social infrastructure in the city. And then, you know, and all of the mental health institutions got shut down and there's nothing for people who are addicted. Uh, and there's a constant stream of people into the prison industrial complex. You don't ask these basic questions. Instead, it's just, oh my God, I don't like, I don't like seeing homeless people. It's like, or, or unhoused people but that it relieves them of responsibility from being part of a, so, a society. It violates the basic foundations of the social contract and it makes it so that we are not connected. And ironically, who was the found, a foundational person in having massive social connection? It was Jesus. He hung out with prostitutes and lepers. He didn't sit there and disparage people for being impoverished. We're all God's children in that way. And in many respects, that's what we're trying to do is recreate that social connection and understand that there is harm being done and we need to be able to accurately identify it and collectively and radically work to restructure society around that. All right, you got me all worked up. I got, I got. <laughs> let, me, let me very briefly, and Benjamin, please excuse me. I just wanna jump in and say, uh, look, the efforts to keep blacks in their place, women in their place, uh, uh, LGBTQ individuals in their place, has been done systemically. It, it has been done through the laws, okay, that restrict their access, okay? The laws uh, uh, that people are proposing to restrict people uh, a right to vote and suppress, that's being done by laws. It's not being done by persuasion. It's not being done by uh, just trying to uh, link our fates. By the way, the laws to, to, to take books out of our schools and to limit CRT, it's being done by laws, okay? And, 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 and that's, and, 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 and the prison, uh, uh, the, the creative prison pipeline are laws okay and their policies and their practices that are taking place all right that's what that's why dismantling these structures anti-racism practices policies and programs are what is necessary uh, uh, to do this that's that's the key point yeah just to to sort of add on to sort of the overall discussion I mean um, I think we need to recognize the the universality, right, of of kind of the the parental experience because that's where we're seeing a lot of this pushback, right? We're seeing a lot of parents 
um, feeling as though they're 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 worried about their their students' experiences in schools. They want their children uh, to feel affirmed. They want them to be safe. They want them to be healthy. They want them to have opportunities. And again, what we have to recognize is that 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 by and large is a universal experience, right? That's what all parents want for their children. That's what they want in this schooling experience. So the, the, the attacks on CRT, we need to look at that in the context of kind of the, the larger um, you know, curricula that, that's being taught and how maybe other students that aren't our, uh, our own children, right, are experiencing school. I think that's really where we need to take this kind of moment to pause and think about beyond our own familial experience, right? How are students experiencing school? What are they engaging with in terms of the, the curricular experience, in terms of the identities of the teachers and the administrators in their school, in terms of the social environments that exist in their school? This is what we have to kind of develop a consciousness around. Because if we think about this idea of, you know, we're, we're hearing from parents, they don't want their students to feel any sort of shame, guilt, or discomfort about these topics of race, right? Part of that is, is we talk about, you know, similar topics, but the, the kind of historical distance between those topics maybe has made people not, not feel um, as willing to kind of counteract them, right? We talk about slavery in our, right? Uh, however, Parker? Can you just repeat that last piece? Uh, we lost you a little bit. More oh, absolutely. Sorry about that. Uh, I was saying that the the kind of historical different or distance between some of the topics that we talk about seems to to have a, a great deal of influence in kind of the the reactions that we're getting from parents. Right. Um, when we talk about slavery in schools, uh, are are students feeling that same sort of amount of shame, guilt, and discomfort? Right. I think now as we're starting to recognize and kind of introduced in, in the schooling experience that the legacy of racism is pervasive and persistent, right? And it didn't end at the end of slavery. It didn't end, you know, with civil rights legislation. That's where we're starting to kind of get this, this pushback. This is where we really have to have those critical conversations uh, around that and recognize that, you know, these, these uh, courageous conversations are important for us to have. And if we can teach slavery, we can teach about civil rights, we can also teach about how racism still exists and it exists in the policies and practices of today. It's not something that we have, have moved on from, right? And it's still present. Um, by the way, I, I think that part of the problem also is that we tend to concentrate on all of the problems all right, and we don't talk about any of the solutions. I think that anytime we have these conversations, we should we should say, you know what, this is 2022. I it's not 1955. It's not 1900. It's not 1865. Okay, and and we need to we need to also be clear that things have changed. That 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 we no longer have a Chinese Exclusionary Act operating in this country, okay? But at the same time, we've got to recognize that we do have individuals that cross three states to go to Texas to, to, to identify uh, 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 Asian women uh, and, and, and shoot them, okay? Uh, we do have presidents that are talking about the China uh, or the Kung Fu flu, okay? And, and that aggravates people. I mean, okay, look, look, we, 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 let's, let's, let's go here, okay? The roots of these problems, that's our next question, go back almost 30, 40 years ago. 30, 40 years ago, when demographers began to do the following, they began to project that the American population by 2060 was going to be majority minority. Okay, And that's when we start seeing more and more concerns about whiteness, that's the Tea Party, so forth and so on, okay? Uh, we've had, we've got the first elected black president of this country, all right? And now we see this major push to turn back the hands of time, okay? I wanna, I wanna, I wanna give you this illusion, okay? Imagine uh, uh, our gang and imagine Sesame Street, 
Okay, many that want to the, the 1776 project, they want to go back to our game where, where people of color were silent uh, and, 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 and we focused on white and white angst, so forth and so on, versus Sesame Street, where all individuals, regardless of gender, sexuality, identity, were able to come out and be free. Okay. That's what this is about. And we need to be clear about that. Okay. Uh, and, 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 and here's an interesting thing. Let's look at the books that individuals are wanting to ban. Okay. From school. All right. By the way, I didn't see anybody talk about Mark Twain, but they did about 20, 30 years ago. Uh, and that's when the cancel culture was on the left. Now we're on the cancel culture on the right. So the pendulum has swung all the way to the other end. We need it in the middle. Okay. Beloved is not a problem. All right. Uh, 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 B.B. King and, and Elvis Presley are not going to cause you, you, some of you are old enough to remember this, will not cause you to go to hell if you listen to blues and if you listen to uh, a punk and, 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 and funk, okay? Thank you, thank you, Dr. Coates, for keeping it real. Um, I, I, I think this was a key point here. I wanted to just tease out some, some things you all shared. Um, you know, in terms of linked fates, for example, uh, Dr. Cabrera, what you were saying earlier uh, in imagining ourselves in these situations and humanizing people uh, in disadvantage uh, is extremely, you know, for example, so we're talking about CRT, gives us a framework and a vocabulary, even as policymakers, to be able to think through conversations and, and actions around equity and inclusion. Uh, because when we have the humility to recognize that we actually may be in that situation or in another life we could have been, or one day perhaps if, if you know, circumstance, fate, luck, whatever it might be, is not in our favor, that we actually may be that homeless person or that person in poverty or whatever, what have you, then we would be more invested in these equity and inclusion initiatives, right? Then we would see ourselves and our kids and, and our potential futures in those experiences and, and care to, as a community, invest and build uh, those programs and social safety networks and whatnot. Uh, so to you know our audience, when we talk about One Fairfax, that is that vision of, of trying to say that we're all uh, in this together because any one of us could experience disadvantage. And it's not based on racial uh, or certain identity-based lines, right? Um, so that's, yeah. and that's speaking again to the importance of things like CRT that give us a framework to operate yeah. within understanding uh, uh, these issues and, and operationalizing them on the ground in ways that impact real lives. Um, and, yeah. and I I know, D Dr. Cuts, go ahead. I feel like you're, you're ready to jump oh, in. I'm just saying, uh, look, we are now doing a, uh, we got a class uh, of, of juniors at Miami University. We're doing a class on reparations, okay? And it's just in line with what you say. Yes, we're talking about reparations for Native Americans. Yes, we're talking about reparations for Jews. Yes, we're talking about reparations for Africans. Yes, we're talking about reparations, by the way, for Chinese. Yes, we're talking about reparations for poor whites. OK, all right. Uh, we should understand that we're talking about structural situations that 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 you start talking about generational poverty, generational lack of access to, you know, what's at the base of the uh, of Statue of Liberty. Give me your poor, your tired, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. OK, how do we liberate all of our people? Okay, regardless of race, regardless of gender, regardless of sexuality, regardless of, of income, okay, regardless of geography. Okay, and by the way, that starts with and in education. Okay, all right, and if we can maximize the educational opportunities to all of our kids, okay, all of our kids. Okay, there was a, a father uh, and a father uh, 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 once said, a priest once said, I've never seen a bad kid yet. Okay, and that father, by the way, set up Boys Town and Girls Town. Okay, it's strange that many of our kids we see as bad. Okay, and they get expelled from school permanently. And when a kid gets expelled from school, you're giving that kid a life sentence. OK, and we need to be we need we need to reverse that trend where our poor kids, white, black, green, blue, yellow, whatever. All right. Have have not an equal chance, but an equitable chance to be successful. And I think playing off of that, one of the things that critical race theory um, does is in many respects, it kind of debunks a lot of the myths in society 
around race. So a real simple one is we're talking about the social safety net is in the during the Reagan revolution in the in the 80s. And I'm showing my age here, but um, that that it was they were constantly saying, you know, uh, who, you know, the the the. Uh, uh, you know the welfare queens, the the black woman who has you know, who keeps pumping out babies, who's driving a Cadillac, who's go you know, and it was it was a very 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 popular image, and it still maintains to this day, and it, it feeds into what the uh, brilliant uh, political scientist Amory Hancock uh, refers to as the politics of disgust. That is that these people are not worthy. And in many respects, a lot of it comes back to the language that we use on a daily basis because it is intentionally dehumanizing. It's not that we're dealing with a massive political, uh, socio-political issue on the southern border. It's illegals are invading. It's not that we're dealing with people who are struggling to survive. It's welfare queens who are leeching, uh, uh, leeching off of the system. And if we look at the empirical evidence that the number one people who were on welfare were white women, but that's not the popular sociological, ima the, the popular imagination around that. And in many respects, that's what a lot of this has to do is, is again, so many of our social policies are rooted in fictitious realities. The, you know, the, and, and we're seeing this right now. Again, we had book bannings in Tucson. We have book bannings throughout the country because this is it's all going to, you know, that the, 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 the people are afraid that this is going to lead to the downfall of American society. And in many respects, the fear and these reactionary policies is exactly what's going to lead to the downfall of American society. And so in many respects, what we have what we're trying to do here is really set the record straight and honestly say, you know, like ask a fundamental question. What are the structural reasons why people are in poverty? Instead of trying to individualize it and say, oh, it's too easy just to say he's lazy and he doesn't want to work. And, and the thing is, it's easy to do the individualized analysis because every one of us knows a lazy person. Like we, we've got lazy people in our families. It's easy to point to that. But it, it's not reflective of why we see these social demographic trends. And the biggest thing is that keep in mind that when we flip the script, and that's one of the things that critical race theory can do, we show that these things are not equitably attributed to different social groups. You know, when, you know, when, 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 uh, uh, when the Trump family puts, you know, gets massive tax breaks for, for going and putting in a specific business, they're not, you know, and all of a sudden we as taxpayers and people in society are losing out because they're not paying as many as much taxes as they should be. We're not, the, 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 it's almost never said that they're the welfare queens. They're the welfare kings. Me, it doesn't, me. it doesn't, it doesn't go like that. The, we don't attach these same parameters to the affluent, to white folk, to people who ostensibly have what we would call a privilege in society. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that we should. But I'm saying when you flip the script on it, it highlights the perniciousness and investedness of racism in the popular imagination. And then unfortunately, those mythologies lead exactly to these kind of, lead exactly to the kind of social policies that we have right now. And let me push back once again, okay, uh, here in this state and also Virginia, if you look at how we spend money on education, Okay, we spend more money in our affluent school districts than in our poor school districts. Okay, those are poor black and poor white school districts. Okay, in the state of Ohio, there's been four separate state Supreme Courts that have ruled that the way we fund education is patently unconstitutional because we spend less money in poor white schools and less money in poor black schools. And we create these structural inequities all right, that keep poor whites and poor blacks poor, okay, through poor education, okay? So an equitable solution would be where we're, we recognize that we need to spend an equivalent amount of money in our poor schools that we spend in our more affluent schools. And I'll give you one example of how that works out. Okay, I teach at a predominantly white institution. It is a, uh, a, a high uh, uh, end institution. Uh, we call ourselves a public ivy. For years, we've relied upon ACT and SAT scores. Okay, and most of our students come from the suburbs, where, by the way, they get SAT and ACT prep courses. 
okay, which guarantee that they're going to be 10, 15, 20% higher than other kids, okay? This is a structural problem, okay, that's not, that can only be fixed by, again, poor whites and poor blacks. I think we get a problem when we only single out poor blacks uh, and, and point out their problems without also equally pointing out similar sets of problems of, 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 of poor whites. And that's, that, that's, that's what King taught us in terms of the Poor People's March on Washington. Dr. Dr. Parker, go ahead. Yeah, sure. I think it's also, uh, again, beneficial for you know, our participants to think about kind of how and where CRT you know, does or doesn't exist in, in our schools. I think you know, the panel's done a really nice job of kind of you know, talking about what CRT does and the power of, of CRT. But as we mentioned sort of at the, at the top, CRT primarily, right, exists at the college level. And even I would say, you know, at, at kind of graduate levels, right? When we actually think about maybe the implementation of CRT in the K to 12 settings, as someone who, you know, spends a lot of time in the public school settings, I work with teacher interns and as a, as a former, you know, K 12 educator, we don't really see CRT at that level, right? Because it, it is a dense theoretical model. What we see at that level um, is, is, is something different, right? And I think it's being sort of twisted in a way to politicize it, to try and make it something that then can be argued, argued against um, almost as this kind of like straw man type thing, right? Um, when we see elementary students learning about empathy, learning um, factual histories, when we see them engaged in discussions around society, that doesn't mean that they're being taught CRT. When we see high school students um, who, let's face it, high school students, you know, they are, um, we, we too often act as though they're not participants in kind of this, this nation and this world around them, right? They're, they're in it. They're in the workforce. They're in the, the real world. They're not just here kind of getting what we're handing to them as, as educators. And when they bring to classroom discussions in their social studies classrooms, their uh, language arts classrooms, their government classrooms, when they're asking questions about systems, when they're asking questions about racism, and then the teachers are responding to those questions, and we're talking about what's happening politically, socially, that, that's not critical race theory, right? That just is, is honest discussions about kind of the environment that, that we are living in and that we exist in, and I would have to say that I think those are really important discussions. Now, critical race theory does a, an excellent job of kind of informing those those discussions, right? To, to honestly think that critical race theory is something that we are, you know, implementing in K to twelve schools, I can say that I I haven't seen it in that way. Uh, and it's our job as educators to provide context to again these sort of these sort of discussions. And again, because CRT largely exists and kind of resides at the college level and even the graduate school level, let's think about the number of students who don't necessarily uh, graduate high school or don't go on to post-secondary education and therefore aren't having maybe these honest discussions about race and society and our nation, right? I think we owe all of our students these honest discussions. We should have the, these discussions in, in classrooms because we want to have uh, an informed citizenry, right? We want to have democratic participation. That's one of the, the goals of public education, not just you know, uh, workforce preparation, but also having this informed citizenry. Mm -hmm. So I think that's that's kind of one of the the things that we need to you know make sure that that we're doing in a in a meaningful way. Um, but again, this connection and the sort of combativeness against CRT is sort of uh, misplaced. Okay. But let me let let's be honest about the fact that there are some individuals out here who are misguided. Okay who are either doing the DNI work, okay, or uh, in, in school. So by the way, I'm, I'm online right now. Uh, I just did a thing because uh, I, I came across book called the so-called privilege game and the privilege walk, okay, uh, uh, that's being promoted to be taught in high schools, grade schools, so forth and so on, okay. Uh, I think uh, at Miami University, there was an individual that, that wanted to have a Holocaust uh, uh, um, um, uh, walk, okay, 
Uh, and many of the Jewish students said, whoa, wait a minute, this is, this is not, you know, a, a, a walk, okay? This was a horror where six million of us died, okay? Uh, you don't have a privileged walk, okay? I'm sorry, you don't, you don't walk through uh, slavery, okay? Uh, you, don't, you don't sit up there and say, you know what? Uh, as some would say, you're, you're privileged and you're not, so let's play this, this game. It's not a game. OK, uh, and when you when you when you when you when you start using this Catholic school, by the way, uh, banner at a football uh, game, uh, dollars and privilege. OK, when you when you target individuals. All right. And try to shame, name and blame them. All right. You already create an obstacle. Again, it's not about naming, blaming and shaming. OK, it's about identifying, understanding and changing. OK, but when we blame whites, OK, when we target whites, OK, uh, and we by implication say, you know what, you are implicitly biased because you are in this group. That's a problem with that. And we need to we, we need to confront it and be honest about it. I appreciate it. Oh, can I, I, I like this. I like this back and forth that Dr. Coates and I have been having a little bit because I want to push back on it just a little bit that, you know, there's a reason why, like, um, David Rodiger wrote about the wages of whiteness mm -hmm. or that Cheryl Harris talked about whiteness as property mm -hmm. or that, you know, and, and all of these different ways. And now we're kind of getting into a graduate level, uh, <laughs> graduate level discussion on theory. And I, I, I don't, I, I, totally agree it, it, it's it's weird because i actually agree that you know a lot of these sort of privilege walks do somewhat trivialize uh they're not someone i think that they actually do frequently trivialize the, the 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 horrific and really violent nature of what of what racism is um having said that i don't necessarily think um that they are the either in intention or even in effect that they create a blame game within the situation. I think that they are frequently, especially when you have a skilled facilitator doing it, that they actually create a bit of a method of critical self-reflection. What, it, how have these things been invisibly embedded in my life that have actually benefited me? Because so, pushing back against the American ethos of, of 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 pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, and so. I don't, like I said, I don't necessarily, I think you and I are in agreement that we don't necessarily like the approach, but I definitely, I, I, I hesitate to go so far as to sort of, um, you know, I, 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 I like the idea of continuing to really uh, uh, focus on these issues of, of whiteness and uh, as it relates to structured uh, racism, because otherwise it becomes sort of like this, well, you're different, I'm different, and no, no, no. <laughs> the, the horrors that were wrought upon people of color historically and even contemporarily as a result of whiteness are, have never actually been wrought upon white folks in that way. They've been, there have been horrors uh, put upon white folk because they're poor, but not necessarily because they're white. Yeah, you know, there wasn't there wasn't a there wasn't a bombing, uh, there there wasn't a ma you know like like the Tulsa massacre. There's no corollary for white people like that. There there's you know the lynchings in the South and the lynchings in Texas that like, targeted blacks and Mexicans. There's no corollary for that vis-a-vis -vis white folk, and so it does it does make folk very uncomfortable. Because again, and that's why I come back to that issue of immunity. It's not necessarily saying you're ostensibly benefiting from it, although sometimes you do through opportunity hoarding. But I'm also saying that in that situation, that um, if we're having an honest discussion about it, I think that we and we and that's the consistent theme across the board is that we do need to really problematize whiteness, but also have a discussion that whiteness is different from white people. And that's actually where we get into graduate level stuff. And that's where it all falls apart in the popular discourse. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned Rodiger, and yes, we're deep in the theories, but uh, and I want to go to the wages of whiteness, and I want to talk about when Irish and Black servants in Virginia uh, were, yes. were, 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 were on strike, okay, and shut down Virginia, okay, uh, and, and, and those Irish did suffer because they were Irish, okay, uh, and Catholics have suffered because they were Catholics, okay, uh, uh, the Ku Klux Klan signs used to say, 
all right? No Catholics, no Jews, no Blacks, okay? And we, we look at lynching in this country, all right? A third of the lynch victims in some years were white, okay? And they were these Poles, they were these Southern uh, Europeans, okay? So yes, uh, and by the way, if you look at the Appalachians, you see that, that their homes were burned. They were bombed, they were destroyed, okay? Because they were Appalachian, oh, oh, and by the way, because they were aligning themselves with Blacks or Native Americans and so forth and so on, okay? So, mm -hmm. the, the, so and you gotta understand that whites, that, that many members of the so-called white group have suffered, okay, uh, uh, for their stance in terms of social justice, okay? They've been shamed, yes. they've been attacked, so and we need we need to we need to make sure we recognize that and not lump them into this thing called white privilege and 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 so let me end with this we all have privilege okay uh, uh, we have earned and we have unearned privilege okay all of us have all right not just whites or some whites okay but uh, I've got privilege of being a full professor okay and let me hit you with this I'm from East St Louis Illinois okay it is called a ghetto. Okay, I got privileges there that none of y'all would have. Okay, all right, uh, and 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 so we we need to, we need to approach this and understand this. Okay, and not target individuals because of their race, even if that race happens to be white. No, and and this is uh, an exceptionally important point uh, because this is exactly what's leading to a lot of the racial anxiety and the division that's happening on a local level in our communities and in our schools and neighborhoods at this point, uh, as you know, as low as a level of school board in in, in public office. So, um, and I know Dr. Cabrera, I'm sure you're itching to respond, and Dr. Coase is going to want to respond. I, I think that <laughs> what I do want this to signify, though. Is, is what often does not happen in, in public uh, discourse is the nuance, that nuance is important, that it's okay to sit in the discomfort of a conversation and that academics who have devoted their entire lives to this subject can disagree and continue to disagree and see things differently. Um, so those are critical points for us to take away as a community. And I wanna also highlight, you know, uh, to some, and, and Dr. Parker mentioned earlier the importance of context, right? So when we when we hear these various stories and examples, we put them back into the bigger picture of where it fits. So even when we talk about something like CRT, and the reason why this has turned into such a challenge of people saying we don't teach it, and others saying this is what CRT in my kid's classroom, is because we've lost that ability to put things in the context and thinking this is a theoretical framework that helps us develop tools to, to conceptualize concepts that are problems in our society so that we can begin to think of them on a local level and how to improve situations. And perhaps they'll inform our human interactions with another as well uh, in the appropriate and compassionate ways uh, that I think Dr. Coates was trying to get to as well. Um, so that's, I'll offer that um, and, and reminding us too that one of the earliest parent rights movements was actually in opposition to the Civil Rights Act of 1875, right? So when, when thinking about politics and how these things are often leveraged, uh, I want us to be mindful of, of the words that are used and, and the anxieties we may feel around certain subjects, but before reacting to sit again in that discomfort, deconstruct and recognize what's a constructive way forward. Uh, and, and CRT is an example of that in the modern time, uh, whereas the Civil Rights Act before was about segregated schools and, and you know, uh, propagating things like slavery. I mean, there was a day and a point in time when things like that were controversial and where parents' rights was on the opposite side of that. So just want to um, be mindful of that, too. Uh, I want to make sure we have the chance to, you know, we, I know we went in a little bit in the academic space um, and, and we are thinking certainly of K-12 education here and, and how it all applies. Um, in terms of the I'm going to go even deeper academically here, okay? Uh, bear with me. So there's the practical side we've talked about, right? How these things manifest, how it helps us to have a lens in how we live our lives and, and what policies we set forward. On, a, on an epistemological level, okay? So when we talk about ideological foundations, there are some who will critique critical race theory um, because of what they see to be division on the ground. And we're trying to address some of that, right? We've talked about that. Um, and, and how we wanna make sure that we, we base human interaction on compa in compassion. Um, and you all gave your back and forth on the privilege walk and whatnot, so I won't rehash. But when we talk about it as an ideological movement or an ideological, uh, uh, as an idea, literally, right? In the academy, I've started to hear critiques as well of, of challenging 
perhaps that it's rooted in postmodernity, um, that it, it, it represents a relativism uh, and an empiricism that discredits um, uh, the, the idea that there is an absolute source of truth, that there is absolute truth at all. Um, because we have uh, come to critique, uh, uh, you know, structures in such a way that we begin to think everything is socially constructed, and therefore everything is relative, and therefore nothing is tr necessarily true, right? It, it kind of just depends. And, and of course, for, uh, for communities of faith, that's a huge concern, right? Because there's this idea that absolute truth does exist, and that there is a divine, and that's what that, that, that's what that represents. So I want to, I don't know if folks have any reflections or reactions to that. I want to be mindful that even if one disagrees with the ideological underpinnings, that the outcomes, goals, objectives, I know I'm coming, <laughs> could be ones that lead us to a shared goal, right? So we don't have to throw the baby with the bathwater uh, in, every, in every case, but okay, I'll pause. Go ahead, Dr. Coates, you're, you're ready to pop and then we'll hear from I, you. I, I, I'm going to go both the Quran and I'm going to go to the Bible, okay? Why is it that most of the major prophets were assassinated? Why is it that Jesus was crucified? Truth In power. both Truth cases, power. they challenged the power structures, okay? In, in both cases, the prophets challenged the power structures, okay? All right, and challenged them to be more humane, challenge them toward social justice, challenge them to deal with the poor, okay? If you love me, then feed my sheep, okay? If you love me, okay, then take care of the widows and the orphans, and by the way, the strangers in your land, okay? This is what Jesus was saying, okay? The prophets were also sitting there for saying, when, when you were a stranger in the land, okay, all right, and you were enslaved, okay, how, what was that like? Remember that because if you if you if you if you if you if you take an individual into slavery because they're poor, they sell themselves to you, make sure when they leave you, you give them reparations essentially. You give them, you know, resources so that they, they won't be poor uh, anymore. And by the way, you have this, this notion of Jubilee. Again, the scriptures document this notion of social justice, okay? And, and, and those that argue that critical race is not based in social justice, all right, and also hu humane ways and also biblical ways, okay? Then they don't understand what, what, what something, by the way, there are atheists in everything. There are atheists in the church, all right? And there's atheists in the temples, okay? So we won't go, uh, uh, they'll go, go deep into theology, but yes. So I, th I think that that what what you're describing of is is a, um, a kind of a, a bad misreading of, of of critical race theory. Um, I hear those critiques, but I really disagree with them um, because, you know, for absolute truth, um, the 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 issue of race being a social construct doesn't mean that race is real. There's always like there's a parenthetical component to it that goes after that, that but the material effects of race are real. And so they, they what, what, what critical race theory does and what critical race theorists have done is parse out those two ideas that sort of pushing back as race is a, bio, a biological entity, which was sort of the foundation of white supremacy historically in the United States and saying that, no, it's still a fiction and it has material consequences. And the material consequences are largely where the empiricism goes. So you have a lot of people, you know, investigate like William Smith at Utah, investigating how uh, 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 racial battle fatigue and how the, the the psychological and emotional toll that comes from constantly combating racism. You've had you you've had analyses of how race is embedded uh, within uh, within legal spheres and how it comes, you know, and how, say, attacks on affirmative action are racist, both from a racial analysis, but also the effects of them in those situations. And so, I mean, in terms of an absolute truth, the probably, you know, sort of the, the axiological viewpoint of critical race theory is that racism is real and it's embedded in, in our social institutions. And that in many respects, it's, I mean, social scientists don't believe in absolute truth because at the end of that, from our social interactions, uh, you, you there, there's no more reason to do, you know, the social science, right? That the a good science should 
uh, whether it's social science or physical science, should answer a question and then lead to more questions after it. And so I don't think in any way that these ideas of, of absolute truth uh, are, 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 are problematic within a critical race theory framework. I don't think that critical race theorists even um, uh, uh, push back against the idea of truth. I think that though that there are also some weird ways that critical race theory goes about identifying truth, because in many respects, especially when we're pushing back against the popular discourse, it's not necessarily saying I am making an argument around truth. It's saying that I may be muddling over here and trying to find out what exactly truth is. However, what these folks are saying is absolutely untrue. The way that the attacks are coming, you know, I may be able to, uh, we may be having a, a, I mean, like Dr. Coates and I are having a really interesting discussion. Well, I think it's interesting. I'm getting my mental juices going about the nature of racism, histories of racism, um, you know, nature of white supremacy, et cetera. And those are meaningful debates that are important to have. But a lot of the people, you know, like, like I subscribe to the Heritage Foundation's website and I get their propaganda on a regular basis. And I can definitively say that what they put out there is not true. And so, the, the, and so I think that the, the exploration and quest for truth is deeply embedded within critical race theory, because in many respects, it's meant to disrupt a lot of our social lives. And also there's a lot of people who are really demonstrating empirically how our social reality is informed by racism on a regular basis. And for that end on both disruption, as well as demonstrating, it seems that truth is very much embedded within both of those components of it. And postmodernity drives me nuts. You know, I and, and talking about truth very quickly here, I find it interesting that many of us have seen an infinitum events that occurred on January the 6th. We've seen it realm after realm after realm. Yet we have major portions of the US population that are debating over what they are seeing. Which which version is truth? Okay. All right, and I think that's what critical critical thinking, and by the way, we used to talk about that too, all right? Critical thinking is about where you're able to look at things and come to your own conclusion based upon the facts, recognizing that if you don't have all the facts, you can't come to a critical conclusion. Yeah, no, thank you so much for that, Dr. Coates. I think the you know essential takeaway from some of this back and forth what, that I wanna make sure we walk away with is we can all come at certain topics from different points of view and different foundations and ep epistemological foundations and philosophical worldviews. And you know, uh, Dr. Cabrera, you said you reject postmodernity, but a lot of people allege that CRT is rooted in postmodernity, right? So how do we sit with those conflicting ideas? The point is to say that we can agree on goals, we can agree on outcomes, uh, we understand real reality, like realities on the ground uh, and know what injustice and unfairness looks like, uh, right? And that's where we can coalesce and come to meet, uh, uh, to achieve certain goals together, even if we're coming from deeply different places. Um, and we've seen that many times in our history uh, uh, to, to, and social change. Um, so with that, I, I do wanna be mindful of time and respectful of, of you all. I'll give you the chance since some of you, uh, this is personal or, or you know, this is your life's work, right? Um, if you want to add a final comment, but otherwise want to also just go around and give a final message of hope. Uh, it is our tradition here on Fairfax. We like to end on that positive note. Um, so whoever wants to jump in. You're muted, Dr. Coates. Benjamin, go. I've been, I've been hogging the time. You go ahead. I'm going to go last, okay? Yeah, I think, you know, ultimately, since this was a discussion around critical race theory, um, I, I think, I, I hope that people, the, the takeaway is that CRT is constructive, right? That, that's sort of the, the purpose. It doesn't exist just to problem pose or problem admire, um, but also to problem solve. And I think that's, that's really what we're ultimately trying to get at, right? And sometimes we get stuck in these conversations just with the, the sort of problem posing, right? We're identifying that we have, you know, racism embedded in these structures, and we're sort of getting, you know, mired in that conversation right there. We're not being able to, uh, to take that and move it forward into the the solutions phase. And I think that's really uh, ultimately what we have to to move into. Um, the the goal is to make 
you know, justice and equity attainable, not through the di diminishment or oppression of, of anybody else, any other particular groups, um, but through the, the process of liberation. So for me, um, because so much of critical race theory, there's so much of the focus, at least in the popular discourse around the critical component, um, that it almost gets painted as some uh, kind of like a nihilistic uh, view of, of the world. And for me, it's it's weird because it's actually a, a, a profoundly hopeful one in the sense that um, it actually starts to really meaningfully grapple with uh, with these societal issues that we're that we're dealing with. But I want to be really clear what I mean by hope in that process, because it, there's so many ways that even that term is manifest and people, you know, sort of like, well, you know, I hope you're having a good day. I hope things are going to get better. I hope I hope I hope. And I'm really drawn to the way that Cornell West talks about hope as very different than optimism. That is that if we take an optimistic view or a pessimistic view, we have a certain amount of um, uh, evidence that points to a positive or negative outcome that's going to result from, from certain social structures. And instead, he says that hope is an eternal hope is, in the words of Paulo Freire, hope is an ontological need. Hope is the foundation of what it is that we do in the sense that if I am not hopeful that there is a possibility for progress, then I shouldn't be doing anything in the first place, that hope is the foundation of it. And in many respects, it speaks to the nature of humanity that because we are imperfect beings and constantly in the process of becoming more fully human, also our oppressive structures are incomplete. They're always what uh, the uh, sociologist Bush refers to as cracks in the walls of whiteness. And the more that we can get closer and closer to it, the more that we can actually strategically see how to navigate it. And so for me, hope is foundational to this work because it gives me the, the foundation to go and be courageous, do this work collectively, really try to uh, strive against racism and, and really try to create a better future because I know that I'm going to pass from this earth and there's still going to be systemic racism on this. Uh, but even with that, I can still make it better for my son's generation and the generation after that and the generation after that. I disagree with Dr. King when he said that, you know, the arc of justice is long, but it always bends towards, or the, the arc of history is long, but it always bends towards justice. I think there's a missing modifier in there, and that is that we bend it towards justice. That is that it doesn't just naturally occur. That is that we have to put our hands on it and bend towards justice. But the foundation of that is collective hope and critical hope and being able to say that a better future is possible if we're willing to engage in radical empathy, if we're really willing to do this together, if we're willing to engage in critical analysis and not shy away from the ugly histories and the ugly realities that we have on a daily basis. The more that we avoid that history, the more we're going to repeat it, but the more that we engage it, the more that we can creatively imagine a better society in the future. Well, I got to follow that. I am a Vietnam veteran. I'm a Christian and I'm a professor of critical race theory. I strongly believe in what's enshrined in our constitution and declaration. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Translating all humans are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I am not a Marxist because Marxists did not have any faith in humanity. He did have a faith in this system and this structure. I was born in this structure. I believe in this structure. I have been quite successful in this structure. And I want that success for all Americans, regardless of race, regardless of sexuality, regardless of location, regardless of class. You know, the, the, the idea that we can create a socially just world. And as justice scholars argue, how do you measure justice? You don't measure it from a vantage point of privilege. You don't measure it from the vantage point of those at the top of the barrel, but you measure it, and what Derek Bell would say, from the bottom of the barrel. 
And when hope, when justice, and when freedom rolls down like that mighty river and makes its way at the very bottom of the barrel, where you'll find white, you'll find Asian, you'll find GPLTQ, you'll find black. And we lift them all up to this space where they can breathe free. Then the dreams of this country that we all share can be realized for everybody. That's, that's the vision I have for our future. Thank you, Dr. Coates. Um... Yeah, you're like, that's hard to follow. Now I'm, I'm gonna have to follow this. <laughs> um, but no, no, I, I, I'm very grateful for you all joining us um, and the hope you've left us with. I wanna uh, just point out once again, for the benefit of our community, even in Dr. Cabrera and Dr. Coates' sharing, there's some different ideological underpinnings that inform where they come to this work through, right? Um, so I, I wanna make sure that we are okay with that as a community. We see that, observe that, and that is something that, is okay uh, for us to sit through again the growing pains of our uh, of, of understanding one another and working together in in this work, which is messy um, sometimes. So, uh, you know, you you brought up even things like interest convergence, right? Think theories that are associated with CRT. We come at these from different places. Do you believe human nature is good? Do you believe it's evil? We, there are philosophical foundations um, that that you know bring us to a different place, perhaps, and how we think about these things. Um, but I, I do remind us again that what is controversial often is relative. What is relevant is often relative. I know many of you community members were asking, why are we having a conversation about CRT? Isn't this supposed to be K-12? Aren't you a school board member? Of course, of course I'm a school board member. And in preparing young leaders for the future, it's critical uh, that we, okay, I, I overuse that word, but that we prepare them uh, for the world and the challenges ahead. Uh, and no doubt CRT has been one of those issues that's been lifted up uh, and weaponized in ways that have harmed public education. Uh, so it's been my duty, of course, to, to address um, these matters. And, and I wanna bring it full circle to speak to how we ultimately break through. Dr. Parker, you used the term liberation. Uh, you know, by educating ourselves, that is how we become liberated. For, for some of us, you know, maybe that's in centering ourselves to know that um, there is nothing worth sacrificing for more than truth, uh, that no matter what, we speak truth to power and we continue to fight the good fight to make sure that we're building a community that's better than the one we uh, lived in and, and the ones of, the, of, from the past. Um, but ultimately, ultimately, liberation, hopefully tonight, can come from educating ourselves, uh, uh, informing our minds and, and inspiring our hearts to take steps forward into the future um, that our kids are looking at us to build for them. So uh, with that, um, thank you all so much uh, to our experts for making the time to chat with us today. Thank you to our community members who uh, intently listened. Uh, as you all know, every other uh, Wednesday here at 7 p.m. on Fair Facts, we'll provide you with the latest on school board matters. Uh, today's discussion went a little bit long on CRT, of course, but we will recap that in the next one, followed by an interesting discussion, as always, for you. We'll see you next time. Goodbye.